Um, my name is Amy Gitchell, and I am a Senior Marketing Communications Specialist with Growth Zone Association Management Software. And thank you so much from, uh, to Jess from Good Enough Now for joining us today um, and making this all possible. We, um, first of all, hi to our customers. Thank you so much for joining us. We are really glad that you're here. And for those of you that aren't familiar enough with, uh, not familiar with Growth Zone, I'm gonna, we're gonna flip the slide. I encourage you to sign up and register for one of our online group demos. You can find the information. Do you wanna, can you flip that slide? Um, anyway, the sign up button is on our homepage at growzone.com. It is very, very obvious. Um, and I'll also try to share that link in the chat section. Um, we are recording the webinar. So anyone that registered is going to receive the recording and it will come to the email address that you use to register. Um, so regardless if someone joins us live, um, they're still gonna get it. And that should hopefully land in your inbox in the next 24 hours and keep an eye out for it. Sometimes it goes to spam, even though everything we send is so awesome and important, it shouldn't, but it's possible. So again, it's gonna to come to the email address you used to register. Um, once we release the on-demand version of the webinar, you'll be able to access that on the knowledge library of growzone.com. There's also just a ton of other helpful resources for membership professionals. Um, go in there and poke around. I Truly, it's pretty helpful stuff. Live attendees are going to receive a CAE credit, um, Certified Association Executive. And those certificates are gonna come via email as well to the email address you use to register. And um, that should also land in your inbox, hopefully in the next 24 hours. It's not gonna have your name on it, ASAE. So that's cool, no worries. So keep an eye out. If you don't get it, just email us marketing at growthzone.com and we will sort that out for you. And as I said at the beginning, while some people were still joining us, feel free to interact with one another in the chat. Uh, if you want everyone to see your comment, be sure to check your settings so that they are set up that way. And when there's a ton of chat activity with people um, basically exchanging ideas back and forth, we try to download that and include it um, as a link on with the recording. So, and regarding Q&A, Jess has a whole system on how she handles Q&A. So she will explain that and you can learn that then, it'd be fun. <laughs> um, and so let's move on to the reason you're all here. And Jeff, how do you pronounce your last name? Pet it like a dog. Okay, so Jessica Pet it like a dog is a published author and certified speaking professional, which is not awarded and not earned by a lot of people. So that's pretty unique. And for almost 20 years, using a what you will soon see an irreverent humor and storytelling with her irreverent that's so hard to say humor and storytelling um, she has helped audiences roll up their sleeves and make space for productive conversations um, she frames difficult subjects which is often in an engaging and welcome way and she uses a blend of politics humor identity and flair. Um, her background, which is really awesome, but would take us forever to cover, qualifies her to help associations and chambers to build welcoming, productive, and innovative organizations. So if you want to join me in welcoming the hands down winner of the coolest hair of any of our webinar presenters ever, say hello to Jessica Pettit. Well, thank you very much. It's funny is my hair is a great icebreaker, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person who uses hair dye that is calling in. I just might be one of the few people who have chosen blue and of all days, it should be green, but I promise it was green for New Year's and it is always dealer's choice. So we already did green. Now we're at blue. Who knows? I go next month. If you'd like to weigh in what color you want my hair to be, feel free to put it into the chat. So here's what's interesting about today's webinar. So when I, I would probably say maybe six years ago, I've been doing this work for like 20 something years, like Amy said, I have very good skin regime. I'm actually quite old. 
But about six or seven years ago, I was asked to come up with an online version of a diversity training. And I was super hesitant because I feel like these conversations need to occur in person. We need to be able to have conversations. We need to be able to be responsible for what we say. We need to be able to do these kind of things. And then what is interesting is I started working with different associations that are different organizations also that have like a swing shift or a night shift. So what would happen is that those in-person trainings were only going to people who work from nine to five. So then what I, I would like embed the hospital, let's say, for example, and then I would do the training for the night shift as well. I really like sleep. So uh, that is actually what encouraged me to come up with what I literally refer to as the defensive driving course of diversity and social justice. So I want to be realistic. Many of you are going to be multitasking, checking email, you have multiple screens open, etc. So I will let you know for sure when you need to probably look at something that's on the screen. I will also be describing what uh, the pictures are because I understand what our lives are like before COVID. Now with all the hybrid models and working from home and homeschooling children, and I'm homeschooling rescue dogs, that's as much as I can handle. I get it. And I wanna make sure that I'm able to provide whatever information you need. So when asked to talk about unconscious bias or diversity related issues, and uh, spoiler alert, in April, I'm doing a program specifically on unconscious bias. I like to start at the starting place. And part of starting at the starting place is that I want you to be able to text message anything that you need at any point in time. So if you want to take note of 202-670-4262, it's a Google voice number, but you can send me text messages, questions, particular scenarios that are happening. And if I can help, then I can help um, as a quote unquote thought leader, which I don't necessarily identify as a thought leader. I identify as someone who makes leaders think. You're going to hopefully think about stuff that we're talking about in this webinar and have a question later. The starting place is a really key piece in order to begin to talk about unconscious bias because people don't even realize the problem of asking like, Jessica, can you come into this, come into our organization and like a Windex away all the unconscious bias. That's actually not how unconscious bias even works. And many of us are not new to the conversation about diversity or social justice or we may not be new because all of our experience is that we are constantly blamed for everything that's wrong in the world. So we're not new, but we're entering like this, right? Because you haven't had an invitation to be part of the conversation. So I would like to invite you to the starting place, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Now, my starting place of this conversation that I think is particularly important is about responsibility. So what do I mean by responsibility? A lot of times when we start talking about diversity and social justice, it becomes a really divisive, polarizing, political conversation, even in the language that we are using that ultimately is talking about being nice to each other. People don't like the way they are being nice, being policed to each other. So I'm going to invite you that when we start talking about engagement or involvement or responsibility, that we very well may possibly be having some different definitions. So some people believe they are responsible for themselves, party of one, and that is it. Okay, fantastic. That's actually what we're gonna be talking a lot about. Other people may very well think that their responsibility is significantly larger than them. Maybe it is generations out, maybe it's bigger than their own family, maybe it's people within their realm of influence, um, for those of you that are in sales, I think this is a really great metaphor, is that some people, when they are in sales, only nurture the relationships of their long-term clients. But they do that to the degree that they are all in the house of Slytherin together and that they are super loyal. But what that means is, is that the product and the customer and that entire supply chain is directly linked to that individual and that individual relationship, which is potentially fine until something happens to that individual. Now, other sales folks, where they're taking care of their immediate customers, they're always looking out to other folks. So I want you to recognize that when I'm doing this work, the way that I'm defining responsibility in an ideal manner is very similar to, there's a, a piece in the um, Muslim faith that is you are responsible to the surrounding 40 houses. 
So if you are 41 houses out, I'm not responsible for you, but my next door neighbor is because that's how the ring of responsibility works. So you might be possibly familiar with that. Um, there is also a fairly misquoted famous kind of thing, which is about seven generations out and thinking about what you're doing right now and what that has to do with seven generations out. So I'm going to approach this in an ideal way as if we are responsible for the 40 houses surrounding us seven generations out, etc, which is, by the way, completely exhausting and a lot to hold. So we will come back to what if we're just responsible for ourselves. So stay tuned. It's coming. But before we get there, as the start, what I want you to do is number one, keep using the chat. Y'all are a really intense community that really need each other and we need that connection more now probably than ever. Number two, you are welcome to use the Q&A. And when you're using the Q&A, you should be able to actually upvote people's questions. You can also comment on people's questions as they wish. And I'll be monitoring the chat as best as I can, as well as the questions. So for example, right now in uh, the Q&A, it says, what is that texting number? So I'm going to put this in 202-670-4262. And there is also very much the possibility that y'all are like, I'm not texting her, but I will give you the number again, because eventually you'll be like, oh, maybe I should save that in my phone and get my money's worth for this webinar and be able to text her whenever I feel like it when I have a question. Just keep me in your pocket in a non-creepy kind of way. So if today we're going to talk about the starting place, what I need you to understand is the way the starting place actually works is about our agency. And at some point in time, we lose agency. So this is my friend Julia and her son James. And it was in the moment of taking this photograph that I began to realize that my friend Julia is about to become a mother. And the mother role of Julia is going to change and evolve as her and James's relationship begins to form. When that relationship begins to form, at some point in time, Julia is also going to realize that James has his own agency and he's able to do whatever it is that he needs to do. And James is now 23 years old. It has been fascinating to see how Julia and James have navigated their individual relationship with one another. So James's relationship to Julia and Julia's relationship to James, but also as individuals and how they have learned and grown from each other and being involved in each other's life, if that helps at all. So I just want to be able to kind of point out that when we start talking about different generations and we start talking about 40 homes and things like this, um, it's actually in a number of different religious ideas that our responsibility is bigger than ourselves. So um, whether it's in the Bible or in the Quran or from an indigenous tribe, I think it's an important thing that humanity is based on what that relationship is to people you will meet and people you won't meet. So that's how I'm using the concept of responsibility. Now, if we take that concept of responsibility and also sprinkle in, oh, these are the academic -y terms that get shown up all the time in conversations about diversity and social justice, you may have heard of the term ethnocentrism. So what's interesting about responsibility is that there's kind of this evil twin, like if we go to soap operas, right, which really gets to entitlement. And the entitlement is centering your ideas and what you feel responsible for at the center of all things. So how ethnocentrism works is that you think your worldview, the way that you experience the world, the way that you, your ideas, your ideology, et cetera, is definitely at the center. So if we take the idea of seven generations, so it is possible that some people may have been introduced to this from their particular faith. Maybe you were introduced to this in Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts. Maybe you were introduced to this because it's a story plot in a movie that you saw. What is interesting is that the idea is not new, but your exposure to the idea is sourced to the moment you were exposed to the idea, which we then think is where it originated, which is literally how ethnocentrism works. So I like to think about map development. So if you were a company that was asked to draw a map of a three-dimensional object, whether it is flat or round is a different workshop, P.S., it's round. But 
If you were to make a map of a three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional object, it's already going to be skewed and distorted a little bit, right? Because it went from three-dimensional to two-dimensional. So in the two-dimensional uh, format of a map, what you are familiar with is probably going to be at the center of the map. So when we look at a global map, for example, that is two-dimensional of a three-dimensional object, very rarely is the North Pole or the South Pole at the center of the map, largely because that's not where people live, right? So depending on what country you're in may make that country or that continent at the center. Being a native Texan, I think it is interesting that one of the largest map producers was actually in the state of Texas. So when I grew up, the state of Texas was almost always at the center of the map, certainly of North America which then skewed the size of Texas to look way bigger than Canada sometimes, depending on how that skew works. If we can be responsible for the adjustment from a three-dimensional to a two-dimensional pace, and we can also be responsible for like, why does Texas have to be so much bigger than it really is? Because Texas is a unique little butterfly. If we can do that, then we can be responsible for the skews and it's not about having no skews. It's just about being responsible for what we're used to and how what we're used to may possibly adjust how other people are experiencing things. If we can understand that, then we can get to kind of the entitlement that we often need in order to understand what other people are experiencing being different. So what I like about this particular artwork from Dred Scott is imagine a world without the United States, without America in the map at all, and recognize that there are millions of people who actually don't put the United States at the center of their map. Um, that's a really important thing to kind of begin to understand when we start to think about it from a country place, can we get to an individual place, right? So some of us, again, I'm individually responsible for myself. I don't need to help out anybody else. Okay, great. So now as we shift to an individual set of responsibility, we also need to understand how words show up and what they mean from an individual place. So I like to start with equity and inclusion. Now, some of you may be more familiar with uh, the word equality in this context, and I prefer the word equity. And what I mean by that is equality oftentimes is giving exactly the same thing to everyone, regardless of whether it fits or not. So if we were to think about shoes, for example, what this would mean is, is that I would give everybody size 11 shoes. They'd be flat, they'd be super cute, probably with some detailing because I like shoes a lot. But if you don't wear a size 11 shoe, then that's not very helpful to you. Whereas equity is actually engaging in a conversation with someone to find out what size shoe they wear, what's their life like, so that you could give appropriate shoes that they actually are interested in, what's their instep like, how long are their toes? Do they like lace-ups or buckles? Or do they like Velcro or slip-ons? Being able to have that custom conversation to actually provide an opportunity to someone that is actually useful to that someone is the difference between equality and equity. And even engaging in that conversation generally is what we mean by inclusion. So a lot of times when we start talking about diversifying groups, so a webinar I did this morning where they were talking about the urgency of diversifying their board, to which I said, okay, but my question is, is once you get quote unquote difference into your board, what are you going to do to actually ensure that they feel included, that their opinions and their ideas, which may be similar, may be different than other people in the room, are actually honored because that's why you actually wanted the different perspectives. You wanted the different opinions to be able to diversify. How are you going to be able to guarantee that there's some kind of inclusion and or equitable space to be heard and listened to? Usually that's when people kind of begin to panic because they don't necessarily know how to do that because they're gonna have to engage in an individual conversation. So now we need to be able to talk about who these individuals are. So even if we just start at what diversification even means, you need to be able to understand how power shows up and privilege, we'll get there in just a second, 
But let's start with a dominant identity and a subordinated identity. Sometimes you may hear marginalized or silenced identities. And most of us have some dominant identities and some subordinate or marginalized identity experience. Some of our subordinated marginalized identities are visible to other people. Sometimes they're perceived and they may not even be right. Our dominant identities is kind of what I mean by being assigned magical unicorn points that have no redeemable value other than they are given or they are taken away. Dominant identities come with these extra unicorn points because that's how stuff works. So if you think about the last time you called customer service for some organization and somebody answers just by their accent or how they talk on the phone, you've already determined a lot of information about that person and if this is gonna work out or this isn't gonna work out. And if you determine that it's not going to work out, they'll ask to be, you would just ask to be transferred to someone else, right? It is important to recognize the story that is written based on our perceptions is what we are responsible for. But it goes back to that like skewed three-dimensional to two-dimensional option. A lot of times in what I refer to as bad diversity trainings, we are told that we are never, ever, 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 ever supposed to make judgments and assumptions because it makes you a bad person. Well, I have bad news. And that is no one is capable of not making judgments and assumptions. So instead of trying to never make a judgment and assumption, what if we just became responsible for the judgments and assumptions that we make? Example, you logged into a webinar. Some possibly chubby, can't tell because of where the web camera is, you're welcome, possibly chubby white lady with blue hair is leading it. Oh, great. You wrote whatever story you wrote about what this webinar is gonna be about when I showed up as the presenter. And then some of you were like, she's from Texas. Do they have people in Texas with blue hair that aren't old, right? We make judgments and assumptions all of the time, 100% of the time. So what is important is that you're gonna be able to notice the patterns of whether your judgments and assumptions make any sense, if they are even possibly applicable and it don't matter because those judgments and assumptions make you feel safe and make you feel prepared. If you can be responsible for how your life has taught you to feel safe and prepared, then that means you're available for the patterns of those judgments and assumptions and why they make you feel safe and prepared. But then you're going to print that story out triple spaced with extra wide margins and you're going to hand it to the other person and ask for edits. Maybe you feel safe and prepared, but maybe you are not completely accurate, right? Now, if we talk about membership recruitment or hiring practices or customer retention or recruitment, when we start talking about these things, this is where these skills come in very handy. You are going to show up to those conversations with whatever judgments and assumptions you already have. Great, you're responsible for all of those. And you might be able to become more accurate. No one likes to admit they're wrong. They like to feel safe and prepared, but can you become more accurate? And I like to call that leaving room for edits. You're curious about this person. So you're gonna be able to leave room and actually take real notes from the person when they start giving you information that will actually make your story about them more accurate. You need to be curious. You need to be generous. You need to be vulnerable. You need to be authentic. That's how you actually get to be more accurate in your engagement, but you start off pretty judgmental with a lot of assumptions because you need to know how to roll. Now, there was a joke in the chat specifically about me homeschooling rescue dogs. They're the only ones who've really benefited from me sheltering in place in 1,200 square feet for an hour, uh, a year, an hour. <laughs> um, they were pretty messed up, right? But one of them, is, she's actually wagging her tail progress 24 7 parenting it has worked and i'll take dogs over children any day you're welcome and those of you that are homeschooling your own children and may have even been homeschooling your children pre-covid bless you as we would say in the south because no mm -mm, that's probably the best lesson is that i'm so grateful i don't have any children and i also haven't broken sobriety who saw that coming Woo -woo. i've been sober for 18 years and we've been doing this for a year and I didn't know if that was going to work out, but so far, so good. Okay, now, with those little disclosures, 
this is what I would like to do. Number one, those of you that are not driving and or are not on a treadmill or something, and you might even be watching the recording, I want you to grab a sheet of paper. We're gonna do a little thing. You are not gonna share this with anybody. It is not role-playing, relax, it's gonna be okay. It's actually even kind of funny. So what I want you to be able to do is notice what your own dominant identities and your own subordinated identities are and what is visible to other people. What do other people perceive about you, even if it's inaccurate? So I'm gonna share a bunch of stuff about me and you can play along. Do I know that you're playing along? Nope, hope you are, but I can't know this. But we're gonna go through this relatively quickly when we start talking about how our dominant identities and our subordinated identities show up, it's where we're given unicorn points and where they may be taken away because of how unicorn point dealers work. So, so my subordinated identities, which is usually where a lot of diversity and social justice stuff starts is in the subordinated marginalized places. A lot of times we think that it's their issue, right? Whoever they are, because they don't have unicorn points and then we burden them with the work of why they don't have unicorn points. So I encourage us to do work from our dominant places, but I will, I digress. So my sub subordinated or marginalized identities. First off, I identify as a queer person. That is pretty visible, largely because I have blue short hair and I do diversity work and people are like, yep, she must be gay. Okay, sure, sounds great. Um, I was not raised by Christians. Growing up in Texas, I was raised by two atheists with very Baptist grandparents. Um, that's not necessarily visible. I know all the words to all the Christmas songs, even though I didn't grow up with Christmas. My non-Christian identity isn't visible, but I do get the unicorn points because people just assume that I'm Christian versus something else. Makes sense? Not really, but that is how people tend to roll. Um, I do actually have some physical ability issues, but I don't like asking people for help. So I don't ask for help. So you may or may not even know about them. I identify as a woman. Usually that's pretty visible just because my name is Jessica. But if I had kind of a gender ambiguous name, it might not have been on emails or something like that until you saw a picture of me. So those are some examples of my subordinated or marginalized identities and whether they are visible or invisible. And hopefully you're able to kind of do your own little inventory. Those of us that have subordinated identities, we do this all the time because we have to navigate the reality of what it means to be marginalized or silenced all of the time. So it's usually pretty easy. But for really privileged, dominant identity folks, there some of them are like, uh, I don't know, I don't have any. So what's interesting is age often can be one of those things where you can enter like, ah, yes, you have been the youngest person in the room and then been dismissed as not having experience that you clearly have. Or maybe you're the oldest person in the room and you're dismissed because people just assume you don't know how to use technology. That's kind of a good example. Economic class is also a good example of kind of entering is that perhaps you were raised in one economic class and then as a functioning adult, you are living in a different economic class. Uh, maybe you're not, maybe you are, but things can change over time and based on context. So for my dominant identities, and again, I invite you to play along, there's different identities, whether or not they are visible or invisible, that I automatically get unicorn points for. I don't even have to do anything for them. So for example, I identify as a white person. That is very visible and not shocking. Instantaneously comes with unicorn points. I am a US citizen that's not necessarily visible because I don't walk around with my passport or something, but how I use English means that I'm a native English speaker. People make that assumption. Because of my vocabulary, there is an assumption about being highly educated and at least upper middle class, if not upper class. And I'm a flaming extrovert who has been sheltering in place for over a year. Please send my introvert partner beer or something because they've been putting up with me for a very long time. So those can get conflated together so that even things that aren't visible then get conflated together and write a complete story. So it's automatically assumed I'm a US citizen who's a native English speaker who's upper middle class at least and also probably highly educated and an extrovert. I don't even have to say anything. You probably wrote that just from my headshot. Um, whether or not I'm legally married is also visible because I have a wedding ring, right? Now, it's on my left hand, it's on my ring finger, so that's symbolism, so that's how we interpret it. But what is interesting about being legally married is that that is or is not even recognized 
um, either by state or different countries, right? Of what we mean by marriage or what we mean by domestic partnership, et cetera. Um, that can also be confusing, right? Um, I am almost 50. People do not believe that. Again, good skincare, but um, it's true. I'm almost 50. That is technically invisible unless I'm like walking around, happen to be walking around with my birth certificate or something. But what's important to notice is that whether it's visible or invisible, it's assumed about me. And what's assumed about me is where I get unicorn points. So for example, when I start talking about being married to my husband for 18 years, then people all of a sudden are like, wait a minute, she said she was uh, gay, which means I took unicorn points or maybe gave her unicorn points because me too, me too, right? But then you actually don't think that I would be married to a man, let alone legally married to a man, because then you have to remember that a man and a woman getting married has been legal for quite some time. So then your brain keeps going like, ah, I don't even understand what's going on. But it's because you're trying to allot completely valueless unicorn points as to what is actually visible or not visible based on the information you wrote about me and how that pairs up with the information I'm telling you but we like to think that the story we wrote is the most accurate. So you're trying to make new information fit into your story, literally called leaving room for edits. So if you can have a better idea of what your own subordinated and dominant identities are, then you're going to be able to be a little bit more comfortable trying to figure out how to navigate those edits when you're giving and taking away unicorn points, because that is the area of responsibility that is the starting place of doing diversity and social justice work is recognizing when you give unicorn points away and when you take them away when you give them and you take them whether you're right or wrong that's a very important thing to understand okay so now we're at power and privilege what i love about this picture and if you're multitasking you're probably going to want to look at this picture just because i think it's fun and it's about math when we start talking about majority or we start talking about power, our dominant identities, what I think is particularly interesting is that we often think that the majority is mathematically the largest number. Like we think almost in a democratic bias that the majority has to be the largest group, but that's actually not how unicorn points work. Unicorn points can actually be the smallest number of people, but actually exert the most power. When we are able to understand how power and privilege works, then we can understand literally the power of how unicorn points work. So when we talk about subordinated or dominant identities, we're talking about where those unicorn points have value or where they don't have value. And that is a social construction that is made up. So if we take money as an example, the vast majority of the wealth in the world is held by less than 1% of the humans. And most of those humans on the planet live in the United States. Not all of them, but most of them do. When we start talking about how wealth distribution works, it doesn't mean that it's the majority of people who hold that wealth. It means that it's a very small amount that hold a lot of unicorn points. And in this case, they also have a lot of wealth or cash or liquid, the access to liquid cash. When we start understanding that it's not about math, then we can start understanding that's how privilege works. But the power of the privilege gets when you look at this picture, are they opening the doors or are they closing the doors? So the best way to really think about uh, power or privilege is that if you had an opportunity in front of you, are you giving the opportunity to someone else? Do you have the power and the privilege of assigning this opportunity to someone else? Or are you waiting to receive access to the opportunity? And that is a very important way of noticing what is subordinated or what is dominant, because sometimes you are in the position of giving an opportunity to someone else. And you may also be in a position where you have to wait for the opportunity to be given by someone else. Power and privilege is just as flimsy as this set of doors. And when you begin to kind of notice that, then you're gonna be able to kind of figure out what you're doing with the unicorn points that you have been given and the, how you are, can take responsibility for the unicorn points that you are giving out. That's literally what these wobbly doors to me actually show what, what it means, right? Now, as we keep going, and I know that I speak like a fire hose, 
But as I'm doing this, a lot of times people are like, I don't care about any of this, or like, oh, no, you don't understand. Have you met Todd? We all have a Todd. We also usually have a Barbara. And it is important to understand that as long as we can point our fingers to somebody else or some other group that they're more problematic, then we will stay divided and polarized, which is fantastic. Great. When we stay polarized, we cannot engage in an actual conversation with each other because we are literally coming from different definitions of the unicorn points of the us versus the them. So what I think is important to understand is that we really get very committed to being right. And when we get committed to being right, then we think us are all the people who believe that our definition of right is the right. And then that makes everybody else wrong. So them over there, they're obviously wrong. But the them members, if they're wrong, them about this particular issue, then what is really important to understand is that sometimes what they are wrong about, if you change the subjects, then they become an us. So it's not necessarily, let's just say, a donkey, because I have my cussing filter in. But it's not just them calling them a donkey. It's recognizing that them and us are how grammar works is the group that's over there that I'm referring to as them will look at this group as the them, which actually is a great equalizer. When we start talking about polarizing opposites, we forget that it works both ways. And again, our responsibility comes into an equitable and inclusion based place to occasionally, not all the time, my mantras do the best you can, what you got some of the time, but some of the time to be able to engage in a real conversation. Now in the chat, there's a lot of stuff going on about golden rule and platinum rule. And it's like, I paid you to make those comments. We're getting there. It is a very fascinating piece, the difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule, because it literally is about taking responsibility to engage with curiosity and generosity to find out some common place or somewhere you two can connect. When we start talking about the concept of differently right, now I am not a moral relativist. I believe in one sense of morality and we can talk about that in a different workshop. But what I mean by differently right is that is it possible that the other person that is this polarized figure on this other team, this other group, is it possible that they have something to offer that might just be kind of a different subject, right? There might be something else that you can talk about. Now, I'm not saying like find your commonalities because sometimes that can actually be really hurtful. And now we're back to silencing and marginalizing identities. What I mean is, is that some people, not everyone, some people, there is a way for you to spend 30 seconds and recognize this is what I mean by the space of grace in my book, but recognizing that it is possible that their life has taught them that this is how they're supposed to show up. Meaning their lived experiences have taught them that this, this behavior that I'm questioning or supporting or not supporting or really baffled by, this behavior is how they feel safe and prepared. Just that moment will adjust how you're about to engage with them because their life has taught them to show up this way, just like your life has taught you that this is how you're supposed to show up so you feel safe and prepared. But notice you're taking a three-dimensional opportunity and skewing it to a two-dimensional map that puts you at the center. So it's probably going to start off as a miscommunication. So take one extra beat, squeeze in that second thought before you actually act with the possibility that maybe they believe they are accurate. They believe they are right. You believe you are right and accurate. Now you can engage in an actual conversation. So if that's the case, then what I think this little image I actually really like and that it is important to be able to understand that the image that you are sending out to the world may not be the image or the idea of who you are or the story that you're trying to send out to the world may not be perceived accurately by other people. That is true. There's nothing you can do really uh, to make people perceive you the way you wish to be perceived. However, you can do something about how you perceive other people. When you are perceiving people and you are like married to the story about that person, you don't understand, right? When you are convinced that your story is accurate, 
if it is not about your own physical, mental, or spiritual, or emotional health, what if you actually took responsibility for how accurate you believe you are through your own perceptions and allowed a little room to be able to find out what story they are trying to project out? Now, I can't do this with 100% of the people, let's be completely honest, but I can do it with some people. And by doing it with some people, then maybe, just maybe, we can actually listen. Now, there's another question in the chat that's like, can you explain vastly uh, I differences between siblings? Sure, my brother and I are excellent examples. We were both raised by very liberal atheist parents in Texas. Now, it took me actually becoming an adult to realize that liberal in Texas does not mean liberal everywhere else. I am super liberal. Surprise. That doesn't surprise all of you. You all knew that I was super liberal. And uh, what's interesting is my I was even a sociology ceramics major in college. The ceramics has really paid off, i.e. I'm self-employed. Uh, anyway, so my brother eventually had to come out. He had to come out as an evangelical Christian minister. Now, our parents died as when we were kids, so he had to come out to me as an evangelical Christian, which went way against what his parents expected him to be. And honestly, I didn't see it coming either. But there is a pattern of him like following structured things, um, started at gangs, drug dealers, and now evangelical Christian minister. Okay, kind of makes sense. I can do that. Um, we have very different politics. We turned out very, very differently. We also both have great sense of humor and very strong work ethics. And according to everyone else, we look very similar. That's very hard for us to wrap our brains around, but we try. The differences between us are just as apparent as the similarities between us. And that's a really important thing to understand that that moment of grace is important. And sometimes I cannot give it, mm -mm, it is unavailable. And sometimes it's a lot easier for me to give it, but I'm responsible for the pattern of when I give it and when I don't give it. Now, I really think that this is a poignant picture for the point I wanna make. I do think it's also important to mention that this is not about Western expansion, colonization, or the fact that we are all on stolen land currently. That is a different workshop. But what I wanna talk about is when we go back to the story that most of us were taught, at least if we were educated inside the United States, is that boats of white people showed up. Now, what's interesting is were they Spanish? Do we consider Spaniards white people? Sometimes because that's how unicorn points work, right? But that's a different workshop. So boats of white people show up and they think they're someplace else, but here they are and there's people here. Okay, so when those white people show up and say, take me to your leader and women showed up because these white people on boats grew up primarily, were raised primarily in a patriarchal culture, even though there were queens. It's important to notice. When they said, take me to your leader and women showed up, they assumed, I'm generalizing, that this was very much like uh, the cheerleading squad, the orientation squad, right? Because in a patriarchal society, that's what women do. Women are the welcome wagon. They're not the real leaders. Now, in a matriarchal society, which by the way, was most most of the indigenous populations at the time def, uh, followed more of a matriarchal society. That may have been the leaders. It may have also been the scouts. It may have also been the people who drew the short straw to go find out who these weird white people are. Who knows? They weren't given a lot of voice. But when said, take me to your leader, and somebody showed up that they didn't expect, they kept asking the question until someone showed up that they did expect. Now, if you think about in your own business practices, you know who you're expecting to be on the other line. And so when that doesn't happen, you keep asking until you get it. So like in my line of work, I need to talk to the decider, not the gatekeeper. So if you give me gatekeeper vibes, I'm going to keep asking questions until I can get to the decider. But the gatekeeper is a very powerful position and often is the decider of whether or not you get to the other kind of decider, right? Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that I'm making a point about operational definitions. So if the people on the boats came with this particular set and said, take me to your leader and women showed up, that doesn't fit their definition. So they're gonna keep asking questions until men show up. Now, those men eventually showed up. Again, I'm really smushing history together in just a quick little story. But those men eventually showed up. And so the men and the men signed agreements that they owned land. Now, for the record, the indigenous populations, they didn't really look at land as something you could own. 
Their definition of working land or labor on the land is a shared entity because the land actually was its own personhood in some ways. So you shared the responsibility of benefiting from crops or what was being supported by the land. They didn't have the definition of owning land, which means no one else could share it because you own it. There wasn't like a fence mentality happening. So their definition of ownership and their definition of who has the deciding factors of power to own something is why this miscommunication happened. Now, this miscommunication is still happening. And basically, we are responsible as white people specifically for failed attempts of genocide. And that is a different workshop. But I bring it to you because the operational definitions that you are entering in any conversation are your definitions and you're responsible for those. It is also the case that the person you're working with is also working with a set of definitions. And where your success in being able to meet up is to recognize what their definitions are and work with their definitions, not your definitions. This is literally the difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule. Now, if we do this in language, we do this in definitions, we do this in symbolism as well. So I like to take bathrooms as an example. There is a sign on the door that most people have agreed what it means. But the reality is, is that I've never seen a stick figure in a bathroom ever. I have also never seen a stick figure wearing a cape in the bathroom ever. So the symbolism is a distortion of the definitions of what we think is going to be inside. And we think everyone agrees with this. And we also think that everyone is going to agree with what's happening inside of the bathroom. But my set of definitions or expectations may or may not actually fit my perceptions of what's happening in the room. So this is when we start talking about like where fear shows up or where predators show up or trans people having access to go to the bathroom. And we say, no, that can't happen because what about men in dresses? Not all men are predators. Not all men wear dresses. And if a man is a predator wearing a dress in a women's bathroom, then that is a cisgender straight man, largely not a trans woman. They're very different people. And when we have this conversation, we don't often operate from a place of where our shared definitions are or where our definitions differ. We just panic. And in panicking, we end up harming a lot of people that are usually not even involved in the conversation that we're having in the first place. Now, this may for some be kind of a, an extreme example, but I think it is a really important piece to understand that we are operating from our ethnocentric worldview center as if it is the center, but we are also operating as if that is shared by every other living entity. And we are never taking the time to find out how those entities define things or what operations they are working with. Now, I like to pause just for a second and remind you that optical illusions exist for a reason. So if I were to ask you, how many legs does an elephant have? Most people would respond four, because by definition, we know what an elephant is supposed to do. Now, do all living elephants have four legs? No, some of them are injured. Some of them may be born without a leg. Maybe some of them had an amputation. There's a great video on YouTube of elephant prosthetics. When their legs get caught in traps, they end up losing a leg because of disease or amputation. Right, there's all different kinds of reasons real elephants might not have four legs. This is a picture of an elephant that is an optical illusion where the amount of pelvi, plural of pelvis, does not align, no pun intended, with the number of feet because it is an optical illusion. I encourage you to slow down enough to when you are about to engage with another human being, even if it's, hey, have you used this cart and you're getting ready to go into the grocery store? Can I have your cart? Or do you want this cart because you're too lazy to take the cart back and somebody else just pulled up? That's my go-to move. Even in these micro conversation moments, can you slow down enough to actually listen to the person that you're engaging with and find out what their operational definitions are instead of just assuming that your definitions are correct. This is literally called basic recruitment retention and sales training, but we don't think about it as soon as we call it diversity and, and social justice. We think of it as a completely different skill set, and it's not. Slow down. Now, when we start talking about 
slowing down and being intentional about your own actions. This is where your beliefs become thoughts and words and actions and habits and values begin to elevate how we actually engage. So not only can we do better, but we have a responsibility to do better pre-COVID. Post-COVID, I think it is incredibly important to understand that we are missing the ability to connect with one another, even people we don't even like that much. Flaming extroverts, I'm actually interested in hugging people. What has happened? I am not a hugger. And they're not going to last very long. And there's probably going to be two lucky people before I remember I do not like touching people. Okay, good to know. We are at a place where if you can slow down enough to actually connect with that person, you are going to be able to recruit and retain actual, loyal, real relationships with other people. You can't do it 100% of the time, but you can do it most of the time. Now, as I said at the top of being responsible seven generations out, y'all are talking about the golden rule in the chat, and it shows up in tons of different religions. Basically, be nice to each other. If I ask you what the golden rule is, we tend to kind of like sound like pirates, right? Like treat yourself unto how others wish to be treated. So basically what this means is, is that what you want, treat people that way. That is a really low bar, right? So I don't like hugging people. So what that means is, is that I don't ever initiate a hug with someone. Now, after a year of being home, I will probably hug maybe one or two people and then remember, I already said that. But that doesn't mean that I am not available. When I go to certain conferences, remember conferences? When I go to certain conferences, I know I am about to receive hundreds of hugs that I have no interest in whatsoever, but it is how other people operate. A golden rule is about treating people the way you want to be treated. And you are making a huge assumption that how you want to be treated is how they want to be treated. Now, it's better than being a jerk, truth, but it's not enough. And what I mean by this is, let's say I'm going to take somebody random. So there's there's a whole bunch of Amy's. So I'll take an Amy. So uh, you don't have to do anything, Amy's. So Amy, you and I are going to lunch. Congratulations. You win lunch with me. And I've already made reservations at a restaurant. Remember restaurants? I've already made reservations. It's at a pizza place. And I've already pre-ordered the pizza. And my favorite pizza topping is green olives. So I ordered us an extra large pizza with extra green olives. Can't wait. See you there. That is basically what the golden rule is, right? Is saying my favorite pizza topping, this is what we're gonna do, you're gonna love it. Do you see how the power dynamics show up there? When we actually start talking about the platinum rule, which by the way, Tony Alessandro's research is what led to the platinum rule, so I like to give him credit. When we start talking about the platinum rule, it's treating people the way they want to be treated, which means you're gonna have to engage in a conversation. Ooh, that's where curiosity, generosity, vulnerability, and authenticity show up. You're going to have to ask questions you don't know the answers to. So I, if I'm going to take Amy to lunch, I'm going to have to ask, one, do you want to go to lunch with me? If so, what day? Fantastic. That day works for me. Where do you want to go to lunch? I was thinking pizza. What about you? Maybe Amy doesn't like pizza. Those things happen, I hear. Maybe they had pizza for breakfast or dinner the day before, so they're not in the mood for pizza. Most humans have not discovered green olives as a pizza topping. And just so you know, you're wrong. It is the best pizza topping because it's soft and salty, but a little crunchy. Mm, so good. But most people don't even like olives, let alone green olives and let alone green olives on their pizza. Again, you're wrong, but that's more green olives for me. So what is your topic? Are you a sharing pizza kind of place? Or are you like we each get our own personal pizza kind of thing? This is literally what the platinum rule means, is that I'm creating an invitation that can be turned down or not accepted. If it is accepted, that doesn't mean we are definitely eating my favorite kind of pizza because I'm still gonna engage in an actual conversation with an actual human being. When we start talking about a worldview, now, those of you from Texas, I'm getting ready to be very controversial. You thought everything else was controversial, just wait. This is my friend, Dan and Dan Jr. Dan graduated from the University of Texas. Now, those of you not from Texas, let me just have a little side conversation for you in a second. Uh, I had to choose between Texas A&M and the University of Texas loyalty prior to learning how to walk. 
Now I'm old enough that I also had to decide between Houston and the Cowboys. I don't even know if Houston still has a team because it was always the Cowboys and I don't even do sports, but I do know that I do not like things from Oklahoma. Um, it's not my fault. It's I was raised in Dallas. It's not my fault. Now, where worldview comes in is I happen to be visiting my friend Dan when he and his wife gave birth to their first child. I was not at the birth, but I was close. Um, when Dan Jr. was born, the very first thing Dan Sr., who now is called Dan Sr., was not called Dan Sr. the day before. Dan Sr., the very first thing Dan Sr. said to Dan Jr. is, I cannot wait to take you to a Longhorn game. Now, what happens there is, where did Dan Jr. go to college? Dan Jr. graduated uh, with honors from Texas A&M because that's called karma and that's how karma works. But what is amazing is Dan Sr. still is capable of loving his son. So even though his actual expectations on his son, they were able to evolve into the son's preferences. You can be responsible for your own expectations while also leaving room for other things. Now, for the record, because people from Texas are gonna need to know this, my mother was an Aggie, my dad was a Longhorn, which is called a house divided, which is why I had to go to college out of state because I'm not picking a parent. So especially since they'd already passed away, that's dangerous, don't upset ghosts. If you can be responsible for your own worldview, your motivation of spreading your worldview to other people and also leaving room to find out what other people's worldview is, you are engaging in a better conversation that is an invitation to future conversations. By being able to do that, you're actually going to be able to engage with one another about how things are going. So I know we are close to the top of the hour. So if you don't mind, I just want to make sure that you know, as we move into kind of questions, and I've been trying to answer them along the way, is that your life, much like my life, has taught me exactly how I turned out. Do I like exactly how I turned out? Not 100%, but you know, I'm okay. What's important to remember is that when we start talking about diversity and social justice work, this isn't a vocabulary quiz. This also isn't a Tennessee Williams class menagerie kind of situation where you're gathering as many diverse things as possible so that you can be a better person. The idea is to slow down enough to recognize what you are bringing into a conversation and recognize that not everyone is bringing the same thing into that conversation. If you can understand in my education, this was called pluralism, then it was called multiculturalism, then it was tolerance, then it was awareness, then we celebrated and got too loud. So then we moved to diversity. Now we're calling it social justice. Now, sometimes we hear equity inclusion and even newer, I would say that it's like belonging, increasing belonging. The point is, is that there is a house fire. And if you are mowing the lawn while there is a house on fire, that is clearly the wrong activity. If individually you pick up a garden hose, it might not put out the fire, but at least it is the correct activity. Being able to take a stand for what you believe in, being able to say why you believe what you believe, question what you believe and come back to it, and also to listen to other people and what they believe is how we will actually build community, hire better people, retain customers, be able to actually do the work that we have been put on the planet to do, the work that we are able to do because of who and how we actually are is the very important piece that we need to bring all of our freak flag to. If we can fly our freak flag our way, then we can do the best we can with what we got some of the time. And doing the best we can with what we got some of the time is literally the starting place of the conversation. Now, I know we're at the top of the hour. My takeaway for you is to notice, not fix, just notice the patterns that you are bringing into conversations. Notice your two-dimensional map. Take responsibility for your two-dimensional map and recognize that not everyone is operating with the same map system, nor are you entitled to their map. If you can do that, then we can have a better conversation next month about how conscious and unconscious positive and negative bias show up. And that will actually enable you to do better business, build better relationships, and do better in the world, right? We can all do better. If you are interested, again, the texting number is 
670-4262. You can text me anytime you want. And I know that there's a couple of questions left, so I'm going to zip it. Some of you got to go, and I'll see you next month for unconscious bias. But with that, I'll turn it back over to Amy, and then I'll see if I can answer some of the questions. Wow, that was amazing. And a little bit of kismet is I grew up in Texas, and um, for me, it was an Oklahoma thing. It was an Oklahoma problem. So that's why I went to school at Alabama, just to upset everyone. But anyway. And it's not actually, an, Oklahoma's not a problem. I've gotten there. It's taken some therapy, but I've gotten there. Oklahoma's not a problem. Right. And my husband said, not including himself, that really the only people that like Texans are other Texans. So he may be onto something. And he said, I've never met a group of people that likes to talk about their state more. And um, yeah, see, look at the chat. Here we are. This, Yeah, we should start a group. Okay. I don't even like sports and I had to pick a football team. And I've lived in a bunch of other states that oddly did not have pasta in the shape of their state. Yeah, just readily or, available. Or swimming pools, right? <laughs> right? Or anything, really. Right. It's sad. It's sad. All right. So with the q and I've got a lot of screens open as usual. I think <laughs> I'm answering most stuff. I think you've answered most stuff. Um, somebody did was hoping to see the subordinate IDs slide again, yep, and that it. someone else was really encouraging you to be an Aggie. So, uh, um, fun fact: I got, I got full ride scholarships to Texas A and M and the University of Texas, and ended up going out of state because I didn't want to upset ghosts. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. I hear it. So yeah. So if we have the subordinate slide, it's coming. All right. Like I went too fast. Here it comes. Oh, there it is. Okay, here's the slide again. Share slide. Go. Share slide. Welcome. Oh, it doesn't. There it goes. It's being pokey. Okay, here are my subordinated identities that it's important to mention that I'm willing to share in a random webinar, right? Like I have others. These are the ones that I have chosen for educational purposes. Is that helpful? Great. I think so. Great. I, I will so. go to your ending slides because I know we're running over time. So I apologize, but I'm trying to do a million things at once. But at least I got to most of the questions I think that were in the chat too. Yeah. And people can text you again. Um, oh, here's one more. Is, is physical ability issues or limitations? What is the question? Know. That's what the comment is. I don't know if Carla, if you. Oh, so on the subordinate identities, um, is a physical identity, is a physical ability an issue or a limitation? Um, it depends. So my physical limitations, I make not an issue because I work my life around in a way that you don't have to know about them because I don't want to tell you about them because I don't want to ask for help, even though I have a therapist. So it depends. It depends. And I think a lot of it, it just depends, but we're at a good starting point and everybody has been so great in the chat and yeah, everyone's been amazing in the chat and a lot of good uh, back and forth. And I don't know that I've ever seen a group that's so appreciative of a presentation. So kudos to Jessica, pet it like a dog. And we are so glad you came. Again, I'd like to encourage you to join us for a no pressure group demo. Take a look, see what the Growth Zone Association Management software can do. And keep your eyes out for your certificates and the link to the recording and any um, pertinent information as far as PDFs, things of that nature will also be on that page. So, and your CAE credit certificate will come in a separate email as well. And that is all gonna be there within the next 24 hours if everything aligns. So thank you again so much for joining us. Keep an eye out for all of our upcoming webinars. We have a really interesting lineup, um, including drum roll. We'll see Jess again and 
what color hair? What color hair will she have? I can't Maybe remember. it should be gross orange, gross zone, um, orange and purple. Can't know. So I there, it's remember. decided. It's very hard to get a hair appointment in my very teeny tiny town. So I can't remember if my appointment is before the next webinar or not. Um, it's a, I live in a very small town. We only have six hospital beds and two ventilator machines. So we are in like lockdown, super purpleville. Um, but she gets to pick, but I did take note that every suggestion that was in the chat, I have already done before and she doesn't typically like repeats. So who knows, but All right. pink, well, purple, we rainbow, will, option. Yeah. We will be waiting with bated breath. All right, so thank you everyone. Keep an eye out for the emails and we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.